part of my duties here at the university or kind of a side duty that I have is uh, conducting the Rolla Town Band. And it's part of my um, uh, kind of my teaching philosophy is of uh, preserving the tradition of the American Town Band because we have a rich tradition in that. Um, and so as I started looking at uh, some of the research out there about the beginnings of our own town band here in Rolla, I stumbled across uh, this little gem. And that is the fact that in Rolla, in the late 1800s, we had a musical conservatory uh, and one that was actually very successful. So my talk today, um, really, again, a lot of my research has to deal with music education in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, kind of turn of the century. There were a lot of different things going on in the wider scope of music, but also in music education uh, at the same time. And so it kind of all came together at the end of the 19th century to create a lot of very interesting uh, stories. Um, a lot of stories are of uh, schools and of uh, uh, colleges and uh, um, just other uh, musical entities that are no longer in existence. And so uh, I also feel that it's very important to try to do what we can to preserve the history that's out there and try to tell the stories and even dig up the stories again, even if they have been told, but maybe it's been a while and sometimes you can even find some new information on some of these things. So the talk that I have today is also going to uh, give you a little bit of background information about what music education was like in early days of America, going towards the turn of the century, which will hopefully put a little more context into um, the specific conservatory that ran here in Rolla, the Western Conservatory of Music. So really quick, just going through a little bit of, of basic history of um, music in early America. Our sense of music education in, in colonial, or really starts in, in the colonial days with the Pilgrim and Puritan traditions. Those traditions um, uh, obviously stressed religious music, specifically hymns. Um, these early traditions, uh, the Puritan tradition, was much more um, of a very simple, non uh, not harmonized, unaccompanied, congregational style of singing. And uh, pilgrims and Puritans, when they came to what is now New England, um, they brought that tradition with them. <clears throat> and in fact, just an interesting kind of side note, the first book ever published in what is now the United States of America was actually published, it was a, a, a song book, was a song book, I should say, uh, from 1640, the base psalm book, uh, which was a, a Dutch, originally a Dutch uh, uh, music book. Uh, in the colonies, you really couldn't, uh, didn't have the means to produce uh, a music book like a modern day hymnal like we have today with actual music notation. Uh, it was literally just a, what we call a psalter, uh, which is just um, uh, tunes that were, uh, or that were not tunes, that were um, uh, just poetry, basically, just metrical poetry. And you could take those uh, different metered poems, um, obviously on a religious text, and set them to whatever tunes were familiar to your time and your place. Uh, so that was the first book that we ever published here in America was a hymnal. Um, as the colonies developed, we start to see distinct musical um, traditions and therefore music education traditions start to develop. In New England, again, it's really based off of vocal music uh, that was used mainly to aid worship. Uh, you really didn't learn music to become a professional musician or um, you know, to really perform. It was really whatever could, uh, could pass the tunes that would, uh, that would aid in your worship. Very little instrumental music was done, uh, at least taught in, uh, uh, in New England in the early colonial days. That's again, kind of part of that uh, uh, religious tradition, the Calvinist view of music in, the, in, uh, um, in religion is basically that only vocal music is really allowed unaccompanied, um, not necessarily even harmonized music. It's pretty, pretty generic. Um, and there was also a belief in the New England uh, colonies of more of a wider universal public education that everybody had the, had the necessity to, to learn. Uh, and that was an all manner of, of um, uh, disciplines. In the Southern colonies though, they focused more on secular and, and a lot more instrumental music down South. Um, you would see um, artists in uh, America or even in Europe touring uh, in the South. Some of the more, as we would call it kind of classical music, uh, the, uh, uh, the more sophisticated uh, cultured tradition, so to say, was being brought up in the South. And that drew a lot more 
of the artists to the South and also drew a lot more teachers that kind of fed the demand for um, the, really the people in the upper class to uh, participate in a, a rich musical life. So it was really just meant for, uh, it wasn't education for everybody. It was education for the wealthy landowners who were uh, you know, involved in a lot of different um, disciplines uh, in, their, in their upbringing. Throughout the 18th century, the quality of music in New England uh, churches started to decline. And so there was a concerted effort to bring about better singing in, uh, in the church. And so you started having what were called singing schools pop up all over New England. And these singing schools were taught by singing school masters. And these were people who had a little more training in music and could teach uh, a basic pedagogy of, uh, of how to sing hymns in the church. And so these singing schools, what would basically happen is you would have a singing school master travel from town to town, uh, would make contact with people in a town and say, hey, do you want to learn how to sing better in your church? And they would put them up for you know, usually about uh, 12 to 16 weeks, and they would have uh, regular classes or regular uh, gatherings to learn how to sing. So you think about a lot of these places in, um, in New England, um, they're still very agricultural. You have like town centers, but most people lived out on farms uh, away from the town centers. And so they'd really only come to town for special events, like on Sunday for church or for other town gatherings. And so these singing school gatherings became more social events too, because it was something you would do in the middle of the week. Everybody would come together and learn how to sing. It would take hours. They would you know, have food and, and, uh, uh, and camaraderie. And so it was another kind of social event that, that, that occurred. Through these singing schools, we start to see new systems of teaching music using uh, different uh, styles of notation. This is where the shape note tradition, if you know anything about uh, the sacred harp tradition, uh, primitive Baptist uh, tradition of uh, singing, basically where instead of learning um, traditional musical theory, like how to build a scale, it's really all built off of four notes. And you can see there at the bottom of the, uh, of the slide here, um, how each note of the scale was a different shape or each uh, uh, syllable, uh, solfege syllable as we, we call them. And so by building up those four notes in a sequence, you can learn how to sing a scale. You can learn how to sing a melody or even harmony uh, just because you learned how to read those shape notes. And the people found that it was easier to do that than to teach traditional music theory, especially to people who weren't really uh, musicians. One of the, the after effects of the singing schools was that after the singing master would leave, a lot of times people would continue to meet and, and to sing. And you would have these permanent singing societies and later musical societies created um, long after the singing master had moved on. <clears throat> and especially in some of the bigger cities in uh, uh, New England, these um, societies, these singing societies would also would start to venture into more sophisticated music, more of the classical music as, as we'd call it. So one of the big ones is in Boston was the Handel and Haydn Society. Also with Boston, they had a big role to play in 19th century, uh, not just music education, but just education in general. Uh, 1821 is the first uh, time that we see public education become a wide, uh, widely accepted thing. Uh, this is when Boston creates the first American public uh, school um, uh, system. And then a man named Lowell Mason, uh, who was, uh, he had served as president of the Handel and Hyde Society for a time. And he also co-founded the Boston Academy of Music in 1833. He helped push for the inclusion of music education into the public schools, which it did at least on a trial basis in 1837. Later, Mason would uh, become the music superintendent for the pu Boston Public Schools up until 1841. And he's also well known uh, as a composer and arranger of over 1,600 hymn tunes. Uh, many of them are still well known, or at least his arrangements are well known. Uh, one that's probably more popular is his tune, Bethany, which is now associated with the, the, the hymn, Near My God to Thee. As, these, as public schools start to become more prevalent in uh, New England, uh, more communities started to follow suit and included music as, as part of their curriculum as well. Southern states, however, were still a little, uh, or they were still largely agri agricultural. Um, and so private study was still the primary means of, of learning period uh, in the South, but especially with music. Um, and again, really relegated to the most wealthy uh, to really learn how to uh, learn about music in the cultural tradition. 
as music became a part of more public school systems uh, after the Civil War, special needs started to uh, arise, uh, one of which was a standardized curriculum. And so we start to see a number of uh, general music courses become developed by different publishers. Uh, so like the Ginn Brothers uh, created the National Music Course. Uh, Luther Whiting Mason, another big name in early music education, uh, created the National Music Teacher Course. And then the Normal Music Course by John Tufts and H.E. Holt. And what's significant about that is it not only gave teachers a curriculum, a standardized curriculum by which to teach from, they also started to create some of the early uh, teacher training for musicians. Uh, began with H.E. Holt, they began to arrange for summer kind of uh, music academies so they could teach their uh, methods to the teachers who would then teach the students. Uh, soon after that, uh, 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 Luther Mason and uh, the, the Ginn brothers, the Silver Burdett and Ginn Company, um, did the same thing. They would do, they would hold uh, and develop uh, curriculum courses for the music teachers. Yep. One of the other things that was happening at the same time as we were starting in America to develop more of a public school system uh, and public education and music, another thing that was happening, not just in America, but in Europe, was that in music, we're starting to see bigger and bigger divides between art music and popular music. So it's like today we think about orchestral music versus rock and roll. And they're worlds apart in a lot of different ways, uh, at least who consumes them, consumes them, how popular culture treats them. Um, in, in throughout music history, we talk about music in kind of um, in, in uh, uh, style periods, like what, what are some of the prevailing trends of musical style throughout each era. And um, in the early 19th century, we're uh, in mid 19th century, we're in what, what we music historians would call the romantic era. Um, if you study art history, there's some of the same terms pop up, but usually visual art predates the musical arts. We're a little slow down on the uptake with some of our style periods. Right before the 19th century and the 18th century is what we refer to as the classical period. This is about 1750 to around 1815, 1820, depending on the historian you're talking to. Um, and that is the music of Haydn, Mozart, the early music of Beethoven. And this is where we first start seeing um, this shift. Whereas the, during that era in the, uh, in the 18th century, a lot of the popular tunes of the time were coming from those composers like Haydn and Mozart. Um, by the time you get to the 19th century, that's not the case. The classical music, as we'll call it, I kind of call it the little C classical as opposed to the era, the classical era, the late 18th century C classical. Um, classical music starts to be seen as a genre or a type of music that is only for the, the rich, the sophisticated, the, the, the highfalutin, if you will. Um, and so we start to see that divide. So in the 19th century art music, we start to see a lot more instrumental music, especially virtuosic instrumental music. Uh, so like artists like Paganini, um, you know, showing off on the violin and creating uh, a spectacle in, in their performances. Uh, even in vocal music, it's becoming much more sophisticated uh, than just playing tunes um, and strophic variations or strophic forms, I mean, um, of music. And so art music starts to become more for the rich connoisseur and the music critic. That's what the, the and so artists and composers of that time are writing music to get written about and to create an audience and, and doing new and interesting things with music. Whereas just a few decades before, Mozart and Haydn were writing, yes, very innovative pieces, but form, they're more formulaic in that era because everybody was wanting to kind of coalesce along this as, a similar thread of uh, how music was uh, was composed and performed. And so in the 19th century, as the art music becomes more sophisticated and really becomes more a, a little more uh, inaccessible to the wider public, we see the emergence of more popular music styles. And this is gonna be music for the middle class. And we see a number of ways this happens. One way that we see this happen is within the art music realm, um, taking uh, like an aria from a popular opera in Europe and kind of reducing it down to just a singer and a piano that you would hear on like an early form of, of kind of a vaudeville uh, kind of show. And so you can experience the high art, but in a more kind of simplistic 
way and, and not, to, not as, as grandiose on a large theater stage. Uh, we also start to see the emergence of minstrel songs, which were popular songs that were typically performed by white musicians, but often played on uh, black stereotypes. We still, you know, we're, we're going to be hitting a lot of that at this period. This is where the blackface performer becomes, uh, starts becoming uh, popular. Um, but those songs are still going to become very popular in uh, American culture. And then parlor songs are another realm that we see in popular music in the, towards the middle to the end of the 19th century. And these are simple tunes that could be performed and sung and self-accompanied at home. And this is the sheet music that you could buy from, uh, from a publisher and take it home and learn how to do it. And even, with a, even if you didn't have a lot of training in the piano uh, you know, from a fancy school, you probably learn, much like guitarists today learn from their parents, they kind of pick up the guitar and dad shows you how to play some chords. Same kind of thing, you're learning a lot from your parents, from their family, not necessarily going to school to learn how to, how to play. So these parlor songs would be great ways that people, uh, middle-class people can enjoy music in, in the home. And I point out Stephen Foster as kind of the, um, uh, although he had some minstrel songs as well, um, some of his um, other tunes were very popular uh, parlor songs as well. So by the late 19th century, music education started to spread out to meet all of these needs. Um, so in the realm of music teacher training, like we talked about the different courses that the publishers would, uh, uh, would produce and create uh, you know, summer camps for, we start to see more regular music teacher training. And it really starts with what are called normal schools. Uh, normal schools start to become established in many different states that really is, they're there to establish, they're established to train teachers. And the way I always kind of explain it, and the way it was kind of explained to me is, if you've ever gone to a school that has a direction in its name, even if they change its name, like Truman State used to be Northeast Missouri State, if it's a directional school, chances are it was a normal school. It was there to teach area people how to teach. Um, and so because you had those, those normal schools spread all throughout, like for example, Missouri, um, you had a lot of different places where you could, local people could go to learn how to be teachers and then take that knowledge to their you know, smaller towns and become teachers. So soon after those normal schools started to become established, music uh, curriculum was not far behind. As far as the training of, of, of musicians in the home, one of the things, both art music and popular music, one of the things that became uh, popular, especially in the late part of the, of the 19th century, were female seminaries. And so if you think about it, if you, you know, uh, music training really wasn't necessarily, if you're just uh, an amateur musician, it's not necessarily, it wasn't really necessarily meant for men. Men were usually going to school, they were becoming businessmen, they were becoming scientists, they were becoming entrepreneurs. Um, but the women were the ones who were taking a lot of these courses uh, in music at these female seminaries. And so a lot of them became established and many of them were um, established through different uh, religious organizations like the, the Methodists would, uh, would have a few, I have a bunch of uh, seminaries, I know there were some here in Missouri. Um, and they gave girls a chance at a higher education. But again, those girls weren't taking necessarily science, math, those kinds of things. They were taking other kinds of coursework. Um, there was a, a philosophy of the time where uh, that stated that basically women couldn't handle some of those loftier, those, some of those bigger subjects. So we're still going to teach them how to, um, how to run a home, how to manage the household, how to rear children. And so music became part of that as well, because music was seen as a tool. If you were, especially if you were a young woman who came from kind of a lower social status, if you were able to make it to college and learn these skills, then especially learning how to play an instrument, then it would be a little bit easier for you to find a rich husband that you could help entertain. That was part of your job. You helped entertain the, the guests, the business associates, and that was your, that was one of your contributions to the household. Um, so that's where we start seeing music in the home. We see, you even see training for those kinds of, uh, of uh, I don't say careers, but yeah, I mean, that's the, those kinds of uh, those lifestyles. And then as far as our music training is concerned, um, we do start to see in the mid to late 19th century, a, an expansion of the kind of the European model of conservatories. And so uh, European conservatory models uh, had start popping up in uh, the 17th century, you know, in Paris, 
and uh, and in Berlin and in other places in Europe. And they were training the professional musicians, the ones who were going to play in the professional orchestras. And we started to adapt that here in in America. Uh, Once we started to create our own um, orchestras, especially orchestras here in America, um, we start to create our own conservatories to train those musicians. A lot of our earliest orchestras uh, were really actually made up of a lot of German and Austrian um, uh, citizens who moved to America to become, you know, becoming musicians here. So eventually we start to train our own musicians as well. And, uh, and so we start to see these conservatories pop up. So some of them that I've noted here, and there's many, many more, uh, such as the Peabody Institute, which is now part of Johns Hopkins University, was established in 1857 in Baltimore. Uh, the Oberlin uh, College in 1865 the New England Conservatory in 1867, Boston, and the National Conservatory of Music in New York in 1885. But we'll also see that music is going to start permeating through other schools as well. Um, the normal, like the normal schools, and even more sophisticated musical training will be happening even in public universities as we get into the 20th century. So, how does that kind of fit in with what we do here, and what what uh, Missouri s and now is, and what began as the Missouri School of Mines? So in 1862 is when the Morrill Land Grant Act was passed, and it gave uh, federal lands to the states to help support um, either putting uh, universities or colleges on the land or selling the land and using the proceeds. Uh, It gave those states uh, uh, freedom to establish new colleges uh, to specifically uh, gear towards agriculture and the mechanical arts. And so that's where um, uh, the some of the funding for the University of Missouri came up and some of the other land grant institutions we have here in Missouri. Uh, Missouri was given uh, 330,000 acres. It was all based on your representation in uh, in Congress. Columbia, of course, was chosen to support the agriculture college, which it still is there. Um, And then there was a decision to support a separate school somewhere in the iron district of the state, which we're kind of on the edge of, but, in 1870, the Board of Curators was created and appointed, and, uh, but there was not a location yet decided. Uh, it wasn't until 1871 that um, uh, the first session of the School of Mines actually opens. What basically happens is there becomes a little bidding war between Phelps County and Iron County of who's going to house this new uh, school of what would be the School of Mines. And the folks of Phelps County found out how much Iron County was gonna bid and they outbid, so they got the school. So the first actual uh, session of the School of Mines is opened in 1871. It's advertised as a three-year course of study in engineering, math, uh, mechanics, geology, mineralogy, chemistry, assaying, assaying sorry, and uh, physics. There are also optional courses offered in languages such as German and French. Uh, and then there was, as part of a provision of the Murillo Act, there also had to be a required in some kind of training in military tactics. And that's kind of where this next gentleman comes into play. Robert W. Dothat, um, who I've been, uh, who went by the the name Dr. Dothat, although there's been no uh, evidence that he actually received, he actually earned a doctorate. He was given given a couple of honorary doctorates uh, from places back in Virginia where he was from. Um, He was a, originally uh, from Virginia. He had joined the Confederate Army during the Civil War. He had risen to the rank of captain, and uh, his claim to fame was that he was the only surviving captain in the now infamous Pickett's Charge at the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, Although I can't independently verify that, my understanding is he kind of talked a lot after he retired, and he went on a lot of speaking tours, and he might have might have overplayed his uh, his uh, acumen there. Um, After the, the war, he became a farmer and a teacher. And then in 1873, he joined the School of Mines faculty. He was the faculty member in charge of languages and also the head of the preparatory department. In the early couple of years of the university, or say the university, of the School of Mines, um, there was a noticeable uh, lack of preparation for some of the students. They were coming, missing some basic knowledge. And so uh, that was part of uh, of Duffett's um, charge was to kind of head up the preparatory school um, to kind of help catch up people and then also go to the community and try to to bring up, uh, get students ready to to come to the School of Mines. He also served as the secretary of the faculty, which is going to be a very important thing to note in just a second. Um, By 1877, 
the School of Mines was starting to see some enrollment issues. By that time, the enrollment had dropped to 43, and there was talk about um, taking away the School of Mines from Rolla and maybe even giving Rolla the teacher college that, that uh, Columbia had and giving the, uh, the mines and metallurgy up to Columbia. Uh, eventually, that, was, that idea was dropped, but Dothat didn't uh, just kind of wait for things to happen. He was really big on recruitment. He spearheaded a lot of efforts to try to increase the enrollment at the School of Mines. Um, he wanted to try to bring in more women students into uh, by adding uh, what they what was advertised as girl girls courses in arts. Um, and there were a lot of different uh, uh, curricula changes that he uh, wanted to make to try to incorporate or try to bring in more people uh, to the university. Another thing he would do, he would go on recruiting trips. Um, not just in Missouri, although he did travel, uh, the Rolla Herald newspaper um, talked about his exploits all over the state, uh, especially down around the south, south, uh, southwest of the state. But he was also traveled to the southwest, you know, uh, part of the United States or what will become the United States. Uh, and he would take out trips to Texas, to Mexico, because there was a lot of uh, digging and blowing up of stuff out west. And you needed people who knew how to do that. And so they would go, he would go out and try to recruit students and a lot of Spanish speaking students as well to bring them back to Rolla to kind of help with enrollment. And by uh, 1880, the enrollment had increased to 71 students. During this time, uh, Professor Goff had also purchased um, an old tobacco factory in Rolla, uh, which was located down uh, between 7th and 8th streets in Rolla, uh, not too far down from the uh, from the Methodist Church over there, and it was a he turned it into a dormitory, which was re, which was known as Poverty Flats. And in Poverty Flats, he housed his children, his nine children, his wife, and many of those Spanish speaking students that he came that he brought back to Rolla. Um, and there's stories that his daughter retells about them sitting at the breakfast table every morning. He would teach English to the Spanish speaking uh, students. Dovet also developed an idea of forming a musical conservatory in the nearby Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church that's right over there. Um, the idea had it kind of came to them after a concert that he had attended uh, the, earlier in the year with uh, another member of the uh, School of Mines faculty, uh, George Emerson. Mm -hmm. And um, again, it was his hope that he could increase the profile of the School of uh, Mines and again, try to recruit more women. And so you can see here, this is why being the secretary of the faculty is very important because you're the one who gets to write the advertisements. And in the advertisements, it's very hard to see on this slide and I apologize, but at the very bottom, it talks about a new, that the, about the girls courses in arts and about a new conservatory in which students can take classes. Uh, and from my understanding, that caught the science faculty a little bit by surprise because it started um, a little bit of a controversy we'll talk about. <clears throat> Doth had printed advertisements for the conservatory and sent them out to over 3,500 papers, uh, both in English and in Spanish, all across the country, especially out West, in the hopes of um, getting more students. And he did this at his own expense. Um, and then they were able to garner enough support, especially from people in the Rolla area. They, the, the early days of the conservatory didn't see a lot of people from outside of the immediate Rolla area, uh, but just with what was around, uh, was able to officially open the conservatory after a couple of small delays on September 29th, 1882. And at first it was just called Musical Conservatory. Within that first year, the term, or the, the name Western Conservatory of Music was coined and it became the Western Conservatory of Music. The picture you see here is actually from 1883, um, where they had moved it. The original, um, the first year of the conservatory was held, classes were held in the Methodist church. They were able to use uh, some of the rooms in the Methodist church. Later, they found, uh, they got a, a building called the Gottelman Building, and it's uh, down on 6th and, um, the 6th and May. Yeah, it's down on 6th and May. It's no longer there. It's, it's, uh, for those of you in Rolla, it's where the family video used to be. It's <laughs> over in that area. So it's, it's the building's long gone and any remnants are long gone. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you can see there, it, start, it opened up with 40 students and four faculty members. You can see largely based off of um, uh, you know, vocal training 
uh, piano and organ training, and then the other instrumental music that's really relegated to guitar, violin, and cello. And this is a quote from Dothad that was uh, from the Rolla Herald from September 28, 1882. The Western Conservatory of Music is destined to be the most important institution west of the Mississippi, and we predict for it a fame as wide as that of the New England Conservatory. So you can see that his hopes, his aspirations were making it like the New England Conservatory, which already had uh, was already building that reputation as one of the finest institutions of learning uh, uh, professional music in the country. His, his hopes was that it was going to be that big, that grand. But again, controversy kind of strikes up. The opening created a controversy between Dothat and the science faculty at the School of uh, Mines. Um, they were primarily opposed to the expansion of the curriculum beyond, they kind of, I think some of them kind of felt that they were overstepping their bounds, their, their, their strict letter of why they were created. They're leaving the idea of, of doing just mines and metallurgy and the mechanical arts. Um, so they thought that, it, that they were kind of overstepping things. Um, and they were also kind of disturbed by the amount of time that Dothet was, was uh, taking in putting all this together. Even though uh, the, the original faculty had a director, uh, Dothet was still spending an inordinate amount of time, as, as the science faculty would uh, say, um, doing um, work for the conservatory. And so the article clippings I have here, uh, and I apologize, the, the uh, PowerPoint kind of got uh, kind of stretched it all down. Uh, one is the uh, the first the smaller one there is an announcement from the Rolla Herald in uh, 1882, basically disavowing the conservatory and saying it's not part of the School of Mines. You can take classes there, but it's not a part of the school. They were very adamant uh, to believe the science faculty were the ones who published that in the uh, uh, in the Herald, saying this is not us. Um, later in uh, uh, the spring of 1882, or 83, I'm sorry, Dothat had published in the Herald the announcement of a summer school that they would be offering in the conservatory. And that was quickly shut down by the music, by the, uh, the rest of the uh, uh, School of Mines faculty. And so that article on the right-hand side, that clipping, is from April of 1883, in which Dothat says, nope, we're not going to do a summer school this, this year. Um, and this kind of starts a fight really between Dothet and the um, uh, and the science faculty, um, which is is not saying I, I have fights with science faculty here, but I can appreciate being a music faculty at an engineering school. I can appreciate that you know you want to you want you want to have the things that you need to, to do the things. Uh, so Dothet realized really quick that if he wanted this conservatory to survive, someone else had to come in and really take it over. And so the man he got to do this is a man named Ephraim uh, Homer Scott, or he just referred to himself as E.H. Scott. Um, for some reason the visual is kind of messed up on this one, I apologize. Um, in 1870, a man named James H. Scott, who was a Methodist preacher, uh, he was also a piano tuner and kind of a pseudo uh amateur pseudo-professional uh, reed organ builder, moved his family from Illinois to Rolla. He wanted to, he had kind of become ill. Um, his health wasn't always the best. And so even though he was trained as a, as a minister and he, was, he worked for the Methodist church, um, he decided to kind of semi-retire, move to Rolla, become a farmer. And he owned a, an orchard um, uh, kind of down by the, the downtown area uh, of Rolla that stands now. Um, he picked a really bad spot, I think, because he has he, he would keep writing articles to the uh, Herald complaining about the trains going by and the smoke was destroying his crops. To which you know, every time I read it, I was thinking, why did you plant your orchard near trains? But that's neither here nor there. Um, so he became a farmer. His eldest son, Homer, um, uh, I'll refer to him as Homer, Ephraim, kind of both. He actually attended the School of Mines in uh, 1873 to, to 75, but he didn't graduate. Uh, around that time, he also began teaching music lessons. So again, it's kind of presumed that his father had taught him and he had kind of self-taught himself a little bit too. And so he started giving music lessons around town uh, around 1873, and then eventually did take formal lessons, formal training from the Beethoven Conservatory of Music in St. Louis, which he graduated from in 1876. Um, as soon as he graduated from Beethoven, came right back to Rolla, 
kind of picked up the same kind of thing uh, of teaching lessons and kind of being a musical fixture in Rolla. In 1879, uh, James, the father, moved the family back to Illinois, to a town called Abington, um, where he wanted to try to find more educational opportunities for his younger children, um, besides Ephraim, who is now um, uh, in his late teens, early 20s. He also had his daughter, Luella, who was 15 at the time, and his youngest son, son, John, son John, who was nine. Um, in 1880, uh, Homer followed the family back to Abington and established a conservatory and heading college um, in, in Abington. Uh, college no longer exists, but we found a little bit of information about uh, uh, the start of that. And um, uh, it, it appears that he, that um, Homer Scott actually started that conservatory at heading um, uh, based on apparently what they, the, the needs of the, of the, the college at the time. Later on in 1883, Dopat decides to contact um, Homer Scott and convinces him to come back to Rolla and to take over the running of the Western Conservatory. Um, Dopat stayed on as manager for at least a little bit of time. Uh, the rest of the Scott family would return back to Rolla in 1884. Um, the father then became, uh, James, became part of the conservatory. <clears throat> he taught uh, piano tuning and gave lectures on how to tune the piano and um, tune the actual pianos all throughout the uh, uh, the conservatory. And uh, uh, so there's articles in the Herald that talk about, you know, uh, Mr. Scott is back tuning the pianos and you'll hear them all throughout the, the hallway. Um, students of the conservatory eventually included Luella and John, who helped start uh, the conservatory band. <clears throat> there's been, there had been bands, uh, brass bands in Rolla as early as the 18, as 1870s, the earliest I was able to find uh, an actual organized group. Um, and they kind of were off and on throughout the 1870s, early 1880s. In 1882, the Rolla Cornet Band, as it was called, was kind of housed at the, or sorry, 83, was kind of housed at the conservatory. And I think it kind of meshed in with some of the conservatory students. And so um, it basically became the conservatory band from that point. Uh, and so this picture here is actually an interesting one. Um, it shows seated there on the left side, that is John W. Scott, that is the younger brother of, uh, of Homer. In the middle is uh, Edwin Bishop Jr. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because it's the son of the town founder of Rolla, uh, Edwin Bishop Sr. Uh, tragically, Edwin Bishop died just a couple of years after this uh, photo was taken. Uh, and then Roy Phillips, another member of the uh, conservatory band, is there on the right side. Uh, John Scott, I'll talk a little bit about because he has another history, which is a whole other talk, but I, I, you know, you, we will touch on him just a little bit. As soon as Homer Scott took over the conservatory, it rapidly began to grow. Uh, and so he started to create a curriculum just like he had been taught at Beethoven. So he's basically taking the musical training he had and pedagogy they had taught him at Beethoven, and now he's transferring it on to the Western Conservatory in Rolla. So the curriculum was centered around private instruction. There were regular recitals performed by students and by faculty. Uh, they also included a community singing class. They were trying to get community members involved as much as they could into the conservatory. So it wasn't just um, seen as like this outside entity. It just wanted to include as much of the community as possible. There were also uh, always new instruments being purchased. Uh, there were recitals and performances that were done to help raise money for instruments. Um, there were also, uh, eventually, um, Homer had made arrangements with the Beethoven Conservatory that students that completed their coursework at uh, the Western Conservatory could transfer right into um, higher study at, uh, at Beethoven. So he was able to use his connections with that school as well. Dolphat, for his, his sake, he stayed at the School of Mines for just another year, uh, but he was forced to relinquish all control of the conservatory. In the summer of 84, uh, he advertised in the paper that he was selling his share of the conservatory, and he swore to devote more time to the School of Mines. But really, the damage had already been done. Uh, he really had kind of soured his relations with uh, the science faculty. And so in December of 1884, he left uh, the School of Mines and took a new job in New Mexico. Um, the rest of the family, the Dothats would stay here for another few months, and the following summer, 
the rest of them would move out as well. Although the Dollfats would still have a connection to Rolla and to uh, the musical culture in, in, in Rolla. Um, John Scott, as he develops um, some of the, the uh, musical traditions that we had here in Rolla in the early 20th century, we're still good friends with the Dollfats. And so there was still this connection. <clears throat> By 1883, the Western Conservatory had boasted 47 students, and they were taking up to 400 lessons per month in all different manners of, of instruments. In 1884, there were 100 students uh, reported. And this just kind of continued to develop over the next couple of years, where um, the, the, universe, the, the conservatory would be bringing in people from mainly, again, mostly in Missouri, but then you started to see more and more students coming from like Southwest Missouri or into Oklahoma or Nebraska, you start to see more students coming in from out of state, coming to the conservatory. Um, a side note, in 1886, uh, Ephraim Scott um, married a woman named Annie M. Lee, whose father was also a Methodist minister. Um, and uh, she had actually just graduated from the conservatory. So he was quite a bit older than she was. Um, in 1888, because of the success of the conservatory and the fact that he was getting so many students from from places more further south and west, he decided to actually move the conservatory out of Rolla and move it to Carthage, uh, which kind of makes sense because it was kind of a, a crossroads, if you will, for the railroad coming out uh, through Springfield from St. Louis to Springfield, but also the crossroads to Kansas City as well. So it was a good kind of central location. And since again, he was getting all of these uh, students from that area, it just made more sense to do that. So in 1888, uh, he kind of closed up shops, shop here in Rolla. I think there were some little slight vestiges of the conservatory still kind of around, um, but, but he and both he and John left to go um, start up the conservatory in Carthage. Uh, they also opened and operated uh, Scott Brothers Music and Stationery, which is going to be another theme of John Scott's life, um, for, you know, uh, having a, a side business uh, dealing with, uh, with musical uh with the music, music and stationery and, and those kinds of things. Um, the venture out to Carthage only lasted one year. Uh, in 1889, Scott moved the conservatory to Kansas City uh, on uh, the old YMCA building on the corner of 9th and Locust Street, which again is a building that no longer exists. Um, in part of my research of this conservatory, one of the trickiest things is that I came across four different Western conservatories of music or conservatory, like, or some variation of the name Western Conservatory. So doing a search was hectic because you had to figure out, well, what is the actual Western Conservatory? One Western Conservatory of Music had the exact same name was in Kansas City at this time. And with, I haven't found the evidence yet, but my assumption is because I was, the evidence that I found was that at this time in 1889, that conservatory in Kansas City had a couple of branch locations. I think Warrensburg had a location. Uh, there may have been another one um, north of Kansas City. But what I was what I was discovering was it seemed like that can that Kansas City location was starting to go under. They were they were kind of struggling, and so it would not be out of the realm of possibility if Homer Scott saw this and he already had a conservatory called the Western Conservatory, and here's this one already called Western Conservatory in Kansas City. He just moved into that building. And actually both the Western Conservatory that previously ran in Kansas City and his were both located in the YMCA building. So I'm making an assumption here, but it's, I don't feel it's too far-fetched to believe that he basically just bought that, uh, that space and took over that Western Conservatory. John, his younger brother, uh, who by this time was 19, he returned to Rolla. He actually did attend School of Mines as well. He's, he was considered an alum of uh, the School of Mines, even though he didn't graduate. Uh, and he became a pharmacist. In uh, 1890, he started to apprentice uh, a local pharmacist, because back in the day, you didn't go to pharmacy school, you just apprenticed with a pharmacist and you learned the trade. And so he uh, apprenticed with the pharmacist and eventually got his license. Um, and he opened, eventually he took over the drugstore that he worked at, uh, which he renamed, uh, it used to be called Luby's Drugs. Uh, he renamed it to Scott's Drugs. And it was on the corner of 9th, or sorry, 8th and Pine Street, um, which if you're from Rolla or you're in Rolla, it's where the Hopper's Pub is now. That is where Scott's Drugs used to be. And at that time, 8th and Pine was the place to be. 
There was the, the Grant House, which is a hotel, had a theater. That's where some of the early musical uh, performances were, were done. Uh, some of the John Scott's bands that he produced, that he created, performed there uh, throughout the late 19th, early 20th century. So John Scott became uh, a very valued member of the community. He was a member of the Chamber of Commerce. He was president of the school board for a couple of years, served other <clears throat> positions on the school board as well. He was a big promoter of education in Rolla. Um, he also directed just about any ensemble that was going on at the time. He directed music at the high school. Uh, he directed the first, um, the really, the really first truly organized uh, band and orchestra here in Rolla, um, the Rolla Town Band. Uh, the, the archives here at, uh, in Rolla has amazing uh, uh, files with his ledgers of, you know, you can see exactly how he worked the band and how, how many people joined, the people who did join, what you can tell these were people that were high up in society, uh, in, in Rolla society. And so uh, basically until John Scott died in uh, 1950, he was basically music in Rolla, top to bottom. Um, but again, not just that, he sold music and musical instruments and music out of his stores. So he sold stationery. He sold textbooks to, to uh, S, uh, MSN students. Um, his wife, Stella, uh, would help take care of students. There was no nurse. There's no medical center here. So if they, they got sick, they had all the, the, the medicines down at the, drug, at the drugstore, and Stella would help um, students. Uh, they were known to be very generous with their, their time and their money. Uh, students couldn't pay. They were very willing to help them out. Uh, so they became um, strong fixtures in the, the raw community. Again, I can go into a whole two-hour talk just on John Scott in probably next year. <laughs> um, so back to Homer. With his move to Kansas City in, uh, in 1889, 1890, he continued that success. He just broadened it out more and became, again, so successful, he had to upgrade once more. And so in 1900, he moved the conservatory to Chicago in uh, Kimball Hall in Chicago. Uh, and he continued to expand the, the conservatory's offerings over the next 25 years. And this is building right here. This is a picture of Kimball Hall. It's on the corner of Wabash and Jackson Boulevard in Chicago. Today, it's called the, it's known as the Lewis Center, uh, which is the law school for DePaul University. Uh, and so um, that's, one of the trips I need to make is try to is go check out the, uh, although I've been told they don't really have a lot of records of that time. Uh, DePaul, I think, bought it in like 1930, so they don't really have much of the previous uh, ownership. Um, one of the mysteries, and I know Katie can attest to this because she's helped me with this, and Carol used to help me with this, is uh, I, we did, I did discover that in 1909, um, Homer Scott, remarried. Uh, he married a woman named uh, Grace Knowlton from Iowa. I don't know what happened to Annie. I don't. The last I, uh, the, I, I have a uh, census from 1900 saying that they were living in Kansas City. By 1909, he marries, uh, marries Grace. My presumption is that she passed away at some point, but I have no record of that right now. Uh, so if I ever sees anything about a, uh, a about a great, or not Grace, about uh, uh, Annie uh, Scott. I'd love to hear what happened to her. As he develops the conservatory in Kansas City and later Chicago, he develops his own system of in music instruction. He referred to it as the interstate system of music. So sometime around when he was in, um, in Carthage and in Kansas City, you start to see evidence of other Western conservatories popping up. And not just, you know, there's one, there was one Western conservatory in, in Emporia, Kansas, but that was started by someone else. Like it was a completely different venture. But you start seeing what was referred to as the, a branch of the Chicago or the Kansas City Western Conservatory of Music. And they keep using the term interstate system of music or interstate music system. And so basically it worked like this. You are an aspiring music teacher in small town, Kansas. I want to be a teacher. I want to be the music teacher in my small town. Well, you would go to Kansas City or Chicago in the later years, and you would learn the system. You would graduate from the conservatory. And so then you would take that knowledge, bring it back to your hometown. Your knowledge would be supplemented 
with materials that were sent from the conservatory from Scott. Scott would write his own materials and send out lectures to, to his uh, uh, former students that are now teachers. And so you would then teach your students that same conservatory system so that when your students finished their course of study, they would also become graduates of the Western Conservatory of Music. So it was almost, almost pseudo correspondence school too, which was again, you know, uh, early part of the 20th century is, is more of a thing in education. So you have this mixture of traditional conservatory um, instruction, uh, private lessons and those kinds of things, but also mixed with correspondence school, mixed with just kind of a created curriculum. Um, and that's one thing I'm, I, I, I'm, if I can find it, it's my gold mine. If I can find an actual, I, we have a, there are a couple in the archives, in the S&T archives, there's one. Uh, there's also one in the uh, Conservative Society archives of uh, just like a, a catalog of the conservatory, one when it was in Rolla, one when it was in uh, Chicago. But if I could find a curriculum, like an actual, like, some of those notes from Scott and, and the lectures that he wrote then, um, but that's, you know, a digger, a bigger uh, dig that uh, uh, we'll have to just take time to do. Um, so the local branches were then taught by the, the these, in these teachers that would come back from uh, Kansas City or Chicago. They're, they were known as associate teachers. And again, they were trained at the main branch, and then they would go out and implement the same curriculum. Uh, the idea, again, is that the local students or the students at the local branch would be receiving the same quality of education as if they were in Kansas City or Chicago. Um, the curriculum for the students it included a diagnostic exam to kind of see where you were before you uh, kind of place you into um, whatever um, uh, level that you were in. <clears throat> and again, uh, exams at every level and, and, and you would have a recital every year. Uh, sometimes twice a year, um, graduation ceremonies from these other branches talk about um, the graduating class. They do a special musical uh, production or a uh, musical re uh, recital. Um, and so each level you would just, you know, you would just obtain a higher and higher level until you graduated. Um, and like I said, the local teachers were then given letters and lectures prepared by Scott himself and uh, um, some of the other instructors of the school. And um, they came praying straight from the main office that they would then teach. And it's still, and even though he was in Chicago, this was still very much a family affair. Uh, his wife, Grace, was uh, a member of the faculty. Even John was one of the officers on the board of the conservatory, even though he lived in Rolla. But he took a lot of, he and Stella would take trips up to Chicago quite often uh, to visit Ephraim uh, and help him out with the, the conservatory. By 1895, uh, before he had moved to Chicago, Reports showed branches in Missouri, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, the Indian Territory, which would be present-day Oklahoma, Colorado, California, and Texas. This thing was everywhere. Um, in 1917, the Rolla Herald reported that the conservatory had 116 branches with over 6,000 pupils. Um, they even had a branch here in Rolla. Uh, uh, it was uh, operated by a couple different people uh, in the early 20th century, uh, but by 1917, uh, Scott's niece, Olive, who was John Scott's daughter, uh, became the director of the Rolla branch here. And then that spawned an entire um, culture here in Rolla of, um, uh, of continued music education, even after the conservatory. Um, the, there was an alumni association of the Western Conservatory called the Euterpian Club, um, which met regularly and gave regular recitals here in Rolla uh, long after the conservatory even shut down. Uh, and there are other instances of the remnants of that um, in music clubs throughout the, even the mid uh, 20th century. And it wasn't just the Rolla Herald that was reporting some of these uh, instances. Uh, I found an article from the Chicago Music News that stated that the interstate music system had stretched, quote, from Massachusetts to California and from Minnesota to Florida. So there's a lot more out there to find and to discover. Like I said, part of what makes it difficult is the fact that um, a lot of other places were calling themselves the Western Conservatory of Music, the one in Kansas City, there was one in Kansas, there was one in St. Louis I really want to find out about, because it turns out this guy was a charlatan, and he stole people's money and left his wife and went to Oregon, like it's this whole story that I haven't uncovered on him, because it's a whole nother, you know, uh, hole to go down into, but uh, um, there, 
they're 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 everywhere. So trying to discern which one was Scott's and which ones weren't sometimes sometimes can be a little bit difficult. But I'm still trying to plot um, right now. A lot of them in Kansas and Nebraska. That was a main uh, uh, area for the expansion of the Western Conservatory, especially in the uh, the early part of the of the 1900s. In 1925, uh, Homer Scott became ill. He moved back to Rolla and moved in with his brother uh, and his wife. And on May 3rd, 1925, Scott died. And with it was the Western Conservatory. After he was gone, there was nobody else to carry it on. I have, I have found no evidence that he even continued in the next fall. Uh, and it, that would make sense. There, there's really nobody to carry on um, what he was doing. Uh, but again, the legacy still lived on in uh, the music that was being uh, done here in Rolla through his brother, uh, John, that uh, again was the face of music throughout pretty much all the early part of the, of the 20th century. Um, you know, even the Scott name is still around Rolla, um, although I, I heard Scott's printing didn't finally close down. Is that, no? And, and as I say, that one's gone, right. So the last time I did this kind of presentation, I was able to say, well, Scott's is still here. The printing company, they just closed down. Um, I remember growing up, the, the Scott's Hallmark store over, I think it was over the Forum, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, the, the Scott name was still here up until literally a couple months ago. So, um, yeah, that is uh, my presentation on the Western Conservatory. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. But, yeah, my assumption would be that once the main office shut down, which, again, I haven't seen any evidence after Scott dies that it continued. So um, right now my assumption is it, it died as well. I would, uh, I would presume that um, the teachers probably still – you know, because you're still teaching, you still know how to teach music, even if you, you still have the materials for the most part. Uh, so I could definitely see that at least those teachers would continue on and teach, even if I'm not talk, talking the, talk, teaching the, um, the official Western Conservatory interstate music system kind of curriculum. So that'd be my assumption, but I got to do a little more digging on that. Yeah, and the connection to the Methodist Church continued because obviously John was, you know, and the whole family, they were Methodist. They, they you know, um, even the things that I, I read about John Scott, I mean, like singing in the choir at church and directing this and doing this, you know, and, and, and the involvement, John's level of involvement here in Rolla, where, you know, even before like, he started the, the band that, that I now direct, uh, 1927 was when the, the, the school of mine started its ROTC band. And so that's actually one of the things I'm looking forward to is celebrating the 100th anniversary of our band coming up in a couple of years. And so I'm actually working on hopefully trying to find a composer to, to write a commemorative piece for us to, to play uh, for that. So we did, we did something similar this past spring, uh, a delayed uh, 150th anniversary for the, the university. It was a little delayed because of COVID, but we did premiere a piece this past spring. I want to do the same kind of thing for the, the band's 100th anniversary as well. But he was doing music at, at the School of Mines before that even started. And, uh, you know, they needed some musicians to, to do uh, a, a musical or a play. He would provide it. Or um, teachers meetings, like they would have like district teachers meetings here in Rolla or down in Houston or something like that. And he would help provide music for that. I mean, I, I don't know where he found the time, quite honestly. It was a lot. So, um, but yeah, and, uh, and it, all, it all started with, his family, obviously, and, and, and the influence that uh, surely his dad and, and uh, Ephraim gave him, uh, but then also what he learned at the conservatory and, you know, continued on even as a pharmacist, he was still, and that's kind of the example I try to, to, to give my students that here at the university, it's like, you know, you're going to leave here and go be an engineer, but you're still a musician. There's still a town band out there. There's still something you can be involved in um, beyond here. So, uh, you know, and John's a good, John Scott's a good example of that, definitely. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.